Welcome, everybody. This is Roger Derling, the executive director of the Santa Barbara International Film Festival, and I'm, I'm so excited to be able to talk to the to the whole crew here from uh, Nomadland. I'm going to quickly uh, read you a review from uh, Peter Travers, Travers from the um, Rolling Stone magazine that says that Chloe Xiao, the Chinese-born director of this wondrous work of art, uh, joins with a never better Francis McDormand and a cast of real life nomads to capture what inspires the human urge to roam. It's a new American classic. Uh, please welcome writer, director, editor, and producer, Chloe Xiao, uh, Joshua James Richards, who is the director of photography and production designer, Sergio Diaz, who is a supervising sound editor, sound designer, and additional re-recording mixer. Zach Sievers, supervising sound editor and re-recording mixer. And finally, Peter Spears, uh, producer of the film. Welcome, everybody. Hi. Thank you. Hi. Yeah, I'm actually going to start with, with Sergio and Zach. Um, this is quite an incredible sound design. I have seen the film three times now, and I'm amazed how specific the landscape um, affects the sound design. As, as her journey progresses, the sound goes with her journey as well. Sergio and Zach, can you, um, can you discuss that? Uh, yeah, sure. First of all, thank you for having me, Roger. So uh, <clears throat> um, during my first approach to, to the film, uh, it was incredible that, that journey in, in my mind. And I was thinking to, to do an organic soundscape for the film and, and following Chloe's idea. So the most important was to preserve these kind of real textures in every single space and season because we go through Nevada, Arizona, Dakota, Nebraska and all that places. And, 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 and we should to make uh, with very specific with the layers of sound and, and be um, authentic and at the same time immersive sound, sound design. So the idea was 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 to to build a a, a real um, a specific sound and uh, uh, and try to find a, a a very good atmospheres in the whole universe of this 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 film because we we know that there's a thin thin line between fiction and nonfiction and build the sound design around that thin line, it was the most complicated for, for, for us. But, but I think we, we, we do a great job. Uh, Is, yeah, Zach, I want to I wanna be, use a scene, a specific scene to, so you can talk about the sound. Like I was, I was so, I'm so blown away by the scene where, where she is playing the flute and, and then we hear the sound outside of the wind blowing, and then we hear also her, her body. Um, you know, can you talk about, about sculpting that, that sound design? Sure, yeah, well, that, that's a great scene because uh, there, it, it's, I think, a great example of what we were dealing with aesthetically, stylistically, and in terms of the materials that we had to work with. Uh, it's it's an excellent uh, example of that, but, we, you know, uh, we started with a really wonderful production soundtrack that Mike Wolf Snyder recorded. Uh, <clears throat> he really captured the performances in the film beautifully. Uh, that is largely uh, as beautiful as, as, as it is, not just because of his skills and, and, and his approach, but also because the framework that he was recording the sound in, which was really Chloe's sort of idea of how she likes to film these, these kinds of stories, uh, really allowed for for Mike to get into the scene and to really capture. He was very much a part of their their unit and was intimately in in every single moment with. I'm sure Joshua and Chloe can talk more specifically about about that. But 
you know, he was able to capture these really great performances, beautiful dialogue. And in the case of that scene, you can feel, you know, the presence of, of Fern in that, in that moment with her breathing and, uh, and with the flute playing, that's all the real sound. But then you've also got Sergio's design that is being, you know, very carefully layered on top of that, which really puts you into the van with Fern, gives you a sense of what's, you know, the elements outside the, the van. We, we really tr very carefully tried to uh, add these sounds that, that were really beautiful nuanced textures, but also uh, keep everything grounded as much as possible and to make it feel as much as, as a, a real thing as we could. Um, Josh, I have to ask you, the, the, the shot that is, it still takes my breath away is the long uh, take um, at, the, at the Wells, uh, you know, van camp and where, where she walks and early in the morning and through the camp. Can you talk about how that, that beautiful shot came about? Sure. Um, no, thanks for bringing it up. Cause I mean, that was, that was a, such a group effort again, like such a good example of the way the crew had to come together on, on Nomadland to capture exactly the kind of light that Chloe and I would discuss for a given scene. I think early on we had, we'd, we'd I don't know when it was Chloe, but the, the reference of um, Bound for Glory, Hal Ashby, oh. um, that, you know, that, you know, really famous, one of the first ever true steady cam shots and just the way that those shots kind of serve both environment and character. It just seemed a great way to sort of bring us into this community in the desert. And then it was just the, I'd noticed the light of a few days before the way it disappeared over the hills. So we had kind of a, almost like an extended magic hour it added about 25 minutes to what's typically magic hour. But I wanted that like kind of the hard backlight. So we just made a note of exactly when the time of day was. And we, we waited diligently and patiently. But in the meantime, uh, Peter and um, the production crew and Mary, our, our AD, were working very rapidly against the sun to get all our nomads and just place, get everything in, create the depth that we wanted for the shot and give people specific actions. And we, we you know, we rehearsed it like you would any long take like that, I suppose. Um, and then Fran kind of gave it a, we didn't know exactly the route she would take, but kind of a general direction. And then you just sort of let it go and, and hope for the best. And, but Josh, when you were planning it and when you were capturing that glorious moment, did you understand that this was a very powerful allegory about about Fern and her journey? Well, I always, I was, I was also inspired by like the Hudson Valley painters like Beardstad and stuff and the way that there's always this um, particular a quality of light or a, the sun's always like setting in the West, isn't it? And there's this decay in the foreground and there's a beauty to it, but also a melancholy. So am I aware of that? I'm not sure, but Chloe and I are always we're always discussing light in terms of emotion and mm -hmm. um, when you're working with the natural elements which I love to I find there's there's much less of a sort of cosmetic um feeling that I see seeping into a lot of cinema like modern cinematography and I I, I guess I have an adverse reaction to that so I love shooting uh, natural light and especially when with a director like Chloe who's always considering it from a character's point of view and how you can add emotion to, you know, the character's place in the story in that moment. Uh, Peter, let's bring you in. And if you can tell us, you, you, you and Francis McDormand um, option the, the book rights. Can you tell us the genesis of the, of the film? Yeah, uh, well, the genesis of the film really begins uh, with the great book uh, by Jessica Bruder and uh, that we were made aware of uh, by actually my, my husband, who's an agent, uh, had seen uh, a, an email blast that the book was being represented by the agency and he sent it to me uh, and thought it might be interesting. I, I thought it was great and beautiful and, and sent it to Francis. Um, Francis had, uh, and I optioned the material and almost 
sort of concurrently, she had gone, been in Toronto for the Toronto Film Festival and saw the writer. Uh, she had slipped out of doing some press and so snuck into, into the movie. And she called me afterwards and she said, I, I think I found the person that, that would be a great fit for this material. So we, um, we got together actually uh, the day of the Independent Spirit Awards in 2017. Um, I, I, Chloe and Josh were there for uh, the writer and I was there for Call Me By Your Name and Francis was uh, on the circuit for three billboards. And we got together uh, in, in her uh, Francis apartment and started to talk about the possibility of this movie. And at the time, I, I think we thought that the film would be a much sort of truer adaptation of the book in that Francis would be um, would play a version of Linda May and you know a sort of an, an account of Linda's story in the book but it was really Chloe who said well perhaps but what if and she was already starting to think about how the story could be bigger and broader and and in fact the very next day I, she had googled uh Rubber Tramp Rendezvous uh, and realized that the next day was the last day of it happening in Arizona. And she said, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, going in my car tomorrow. I'm gonna go check it out. I'll send you messages from the road and let you know if I find anything. And that was really the beginning of, of the creation and her creative process uh, as she went deeper and deeper into this community and brought us along the way. Um, and Chloe, um, I mean, Oz cinephiles know about your unconventional approach to, to, and your process. But if you don't mind telling our viewers about how you approach this film and the fact that you have Francis McDormand and David Strathern, the are the only actors correct, and everybody around it is actual real nomads. Uh, yeah, also Melissa Smith, who played uh, Fern's sister, uh, she she is an actress as well. Correct. Um, so would you mind, um, you know, telling? Yeah, yeah of course. Um, I think just, uh, you know, uh, on what Peter was saying, uh, that the, it, it, we were thinking, I mean, they were thinking maybe Fern, uh, Fern will play Linda May, but then, you know, when they sent me the book, Jessica had done an incredible job. I mean, she she it, it, there's a through line of following Linda May of her struggle and then eventually getting land. But there's so much more in the book. There's a, one chapter, for example, is called Empire, right? And it's about Empire and about the entire chapter. And I was reading that chapter and the whole chapter on course at Arizona and the whole chapter about working at Bee Harvest. And, and in my mind, I go, how am I going to how are we going to be able to include all these interesting things that she found that really she was capturing a time. It wasn't just about one person. It was a time, you know, in America. And, and how can we do that? And so the idea of creating a fictional character that can really incorporate all the things that's in her book and also another layer of the um, folks we met and the places we encountered along the way. And then another layer on top of that, which is friend. Uh, generously sharing a part of her own life as well, because for me, it's almost impossible if Francis and David would not share part of their own life and mm. allow me to create characters that are a version of themselves, right? And, and you know, you probably have read a little bit of what what part of Fern is friend, and even for David, the the young man that played his son in the movie is his son. And the two of them playing the piano together is something they've done in their lives for a long time. So the, the trick of, of having them blend into the movie as, as Linda May and Bob Wells and Swanky would is that they would have to uh, allow me to get to know them and write in a way part of themselves into their characters. And um, Josh, how much time do you and your crew have in each community and and how did you guys become invisible and were able to capture what you capture a lot of it starts with that first process um you know that chloe is referring to um that i i was i went to meet everyone uh, on a separate kind of um 
prep scout, I suppose, um, or develop during development. Chloe and I, we went and met all the nomads. So the purpose of that was not just Chloe for me a connection, but them getting used to being around me since I'm going to be the person all up in their space all the time with the camera. Um, and then we would do some little lens, uh, some some camera tests with our kind of first timers like Linda May and Swanky. So I think a lot of the trick, like like any um, illusion in that way, Roger, it's all in prep, really. It's all that invisible work you do beforehand uh, before you before you uh, press record, uh, because by the time the camera's up, Chloe's created such a connection with these people that we are all kind of hanging out, listening to Swanky's story. That's actually what's happening. And that's what you're seeing on like take place on camera. So that's why I always kind of describe like Chloe does the, the work so that she creates the environment and then puts the camera into it. And that's kind of why you get a slightly different texture to the performances. Because to my eye and my taste, I actually find these kinds of performances more true to life. They may sometimes seem strange sometimes and out of place in a movie. But if you consider them, it's, it's because that's how people act in, in life, not how they act in movies. Just, just my opinion. Mm -hmm. and, and actually, can I add to that for a yeah, second? Yeah, of course. I think um, what was also kind of cool about this situation and very smart of, of Chloe and Josh was, uh, you know, we, uh, this is the way they shot movies, their last few movies this way. Uh, and, and with Molly Asher, who was another producer uh, of ours who worked with us, uh, and then Dan Janvey, who was uh, another producer who'd worked with Ben Zeitling, working with real people, they, they knew how, they had some idea of how this would work when you embed yourself with these very real people and live with them. But they also knew that the rest of us had never done it before. So they had the idea that we might need a boot camp. And uh, so we, we actually shot for two weeks. Uh, we needed some summertime seasonal sh shooting. So, almost, so in the summer, we gathered in the Badlands and for two weeks we did some shooting, but it was also meant so that we could all learn this shorthand of how to make a movie uh, with and live respectfully as well with, these, with all these new people. Uh, and it was pretty remarkable uh, to kind of get very quickly into their mindset so that we all then, when we knew we had this big four month window coming in the middle of winter with much shorter days and, you know, and, and doing the magic hour hustle, I guess, uh, as, as they would refer to that time when we would be racing against the sun to shoot, uh, that we would really need to know our choreography very well. So that, that was super helpful and, and great to have that experience early on and, and for them to bring us along in that way. Mm. And also Roger, just to um, answer the rest of your question, it's about the crew as well. It's also about the way Chloe and uh, like selected the crew because it's also having the right kind of people and temperaments when you're going into situations like this. You know, so much of the naturalism of Nomadland is owed to like real human connections. It's not a film crew coming in and kind of making a movie. It's a sort of a, like Chloe would often describe it as like community theater. Mm, wow. That's a much beautiful for me. I'm sorry, I would like to add something because it, for me it was very interesting, this, this warm community. So our, our contribution as a sound designer was to, to create this emotional connection with the audience. And, and, and I start building in my mind the, the DNA of the, of the film was, was fragility for me, you know, the meaning of that word should be in a different treatments. So I built three stages of, of, of sounds, you know, prominent with serenity and with silence. And during the whole journey, everything should be in a harmonic balance, all the layers of sounds. So uh, that's, that's, the, that's the most authentic for this, for this beautiful film. Um, and Zach, I was going to ask about the layer of music. Um, you know, Ludovico Ionardi, his music. How did you, how did you guys work and use that um, and incorporate it into this with mixed in with the sound? 
Uh, well, we were really lucky. Chloe kind of knew from day one that she wanted to work with his material and had had really built her edit uh, around these beautiful cues. And so, uh, you know, normally with sound design, there's there's often a lot of evolution to the music that's happening concurrently with sound design. And in our case, we really had those cues in place from the very beginning, and we were able to really design sounds that were harmonious with that music. Um, and so in terms of mixing it, you know, having Sergio's amazing designed elements that, that were already working in sync with the music kind of helped everything to sort of fall into place. And we, we knew with, with Chloe that she really wanted the music to be the driving, the emotional driving force. Anytime the music is present, it's really uh, mostly in those montages that are just so gorgeous and, and so moving. Um, and, and very, very uh, few times in the film do we ever hear music playing in a scene. So it's really, you know, for us in terms of the mix, kind of presenting the music in, its, in all of its glory um, and then coupling it with sound design that that just feels right for for what we're seeing on screen. Um, Chloe, you had um, so so I understand you had a screenplay, but 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 you you were improvising as well as you went along. Am I is that a right way to to put it? Yeah, I I know I, I don't think I would ever be able to lock a screenplay. <laughs> Sorry. No, 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 I love that. Are you kidding me? That's a must have for 2020 uh, Q and A's is your dog barking. Um, anyway, that's Rooster. I, I don't think I will ever be able to lock the screenplay until towards the end of the shoot because the maybe I was educated in a different way of filmmaking uh, because the idea of a, a screenplay that's, that's workshop to perfection and then achieving exactly that with a very skilled, um, um, you know, uh, production process, and then the movie—that's not—that's not how I was educated and raised. So, and and but some of my favorite movies are made that way. Uh, I definitely love that type of filmmaking. But for me, I need the real life to inspire me as a writer. Um, and sometimes that real life doesn't happen until we all get in to this little organism of a, of a film production, you know, and, and the, the actors and we get to set and then things happen. So uh, I watch dailies and I would write new pages and the story, but, but I've learned from my first film is that in order to work that way, you have to have a very strong emotional arc for your lead character, a very strong uh, foundation. And that's down in the uh, uh, prep stage. Like Peter was, uh, Josh was saying, in order to have a lot of um, spontaneous and freedom while we're shooting, you have to have the best planning possible. Like any good road tripper would tell you, to have a really great road trip, you have to plan. <laughs> and it's the same as produ for the producing aspect of this film, but also writing. And what was the most surprising thing that, that you captured or that happened that wasn't planned? Ooh, Josh is thinking too. I can say that Derek, Derek, the young man who with the tattoo, uh, but you guys should talk more about him. I just have a really quick ver version of that story, which is it was a, a young girl named Echo who was pregnant. That was in my script. And as uh, Hannah Peterson, uh, you know, uh, uh, who would done our street casting for us and she got out to look for this young woman and then she's, and in, in one of her videos, there was Derek talking. As soon as he opened her mouth, he's going to start talking. We were like, what era are you from? <laughs> Please be in our movie. Um, Josh, yeah, yeah Derek, go ahead, Peter. Well, I was going to say Derek was great because, I mean, that's not a costume. That is Derek. That's the way Derek looks and lives his life. He's been riding trains. Uh, you know, he's from Wisconsin, but he, he headed out on the open road and wanted to see new vistas from an early age and, and he does it with his parents blessing now an adult young adult can do whatever he wants but but also what was sort of great was we we met him and, and he became part of the family of the movie making beyond just the character he actually ended up working in, in a couple different departments on the film and uh and traveled with us a bit to the end so it was really the ethos of the i mean derek really embodies the ethos of this whole movie which was not was to work, you know, come in 
to these people's uh, lives and, and sort of, you know, tap into this sort of shared humanity and to bring along all of us, instead of telling their story, we were all together creating the story every day. And uh, it was pretty remarkable. And speaking uh, of Derek, plus, the, plus oh, was, go ahead, Chloe, go ahead. Plus he might have been the only one that can fix a flat. Yes, there was that too. <laughs> um, and so something like like the sun in number 18, which is, it's the, I've seen it a couple of times now, your film, and it, it always gets me so emotional to listen to Shakespeare. So that's something that came afterwards after you met Derek and Chloe? I, you know what, the, the script has changed a lot. At some point, I think even towards the early, when we started production, it was still Ico and there was no sound. In. And it was during the show after, yeah, after we met Derek and there's something about the way Derek speaks as well. It's like oral history of, you know, and then it's Fran. And again, having, the more we work with Fran, the more we discover Fern, the more we realize like how much Fran can we bring into Fern? You know, so then then as we went on and it just came out a conversation with friends that, you know what, um, you need to do Shakespeare. <laughs> and, and she teaches, you know, she, she, she's a friend, a teacher, a, a, um, English teacher in Empire. And then once we shot the scene with a young, young girl in the sporting goods store. Right. And we go, we got to do this again. We got to call back to this. And it's just perfect. After meeting Derek, I feel like he can handle being in a scene when Fran is citing Shakespeare, you know, <laughs> he will be right in the right place. Yes, Josh. Well, Roger, going back to the Western as well, isn't there something that often pops up in those films a bit, the, the, the relationship with the old world, like in My Darling Clementine, there's the, the old theatre actor, isn't there? And um, it, oftentimes that's sort of an archetype in, in Westerns. It, it kind of reminded me of that as well. Which, which I, I have to ask you before I forget about the last shot of, of the movie. And The Searchers is one of my favorite movies. And you obviously have the iconic shot, the frame and going out in the, in the wilderness. And, and the last shot of your film, you know, she's contained inside the, the, the home and empire and she walks out. Um, you know, can you talk, Josh, about that? that shot? I could say what my thoughts are on it, um, certainly, but I would like it to be open to interpretation, obviously. But I do, I mean, Chloe and I, we do like to push the way films are made um, and kind of almost challenge that, like the roles on sets even sometimes, but we also like to ground things in the kind of cinematic tradition. And, um, you know, and I, it's really exciting to kind of draw on these older sort of cinematic, this older cinematic classic language and bring it into a really kind of modern uh, way of making films. So, yes, everyone knows the opening and closing shot of The Searchers, but it, this is about what's different here, though. We still have the woman looking out, but this time there isn't, there's no wanderer coming in between the winds. There's no Ethan Edwards anymore. Fern is completely alone in this landscape, which by now is fenced in. The, the, the wilderness is now completely tamed. Um, in fact, it's completely decayed and, and defeated. And instead of the door closing and, and us being inside the, the homestead with the wilderness outside, it's the opposite. Fern, Fern, the woman this time, chooses to go out of the open door into the freedom of the wilderness. And that's where she can find her new identity. And that was, Chloe's laughing at me. Yeah, that's really beautiful, but I will tell you my version of that, which is I, I've always written, ever since I've been to Empire Steps in the House doing prep, and I was like, the film has to end with her walking out. Obviously, as an editor, I made a different choice. There's another shot after that, but it was, I was like, it's got, that's the shot. And then once we get to set, I describe it to Josh, he's like, that's a dolly shot, and we don't have a dolly. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he, well, well, Josh, well that's not how it happened, Chloe. It was, we, we came up with that in when we went on prep on the scout. That's what I mean, on prep, but then we didn't, and I was very, because we didn't have a lot of time, and we just had, and just, it can't lay the dolly, it just isn't going to happen. Um, 
So Josh did an incredible job with the Rona and, 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 and the way we're able to do it a few times. Are you rolling your eyes now? But that's my, my memories of it. Um, in the edit though, you know, it's really interesting because the script is still ends there. Uh, she she would walk into the wilderness. And and uh, for some reason uh, in the edit, there, it felt incomplete. Um, and, and then we discovered the shot of her um, uh, driving away in Vanguard. And we don't know, we don't see her face, but just this this band. It's almost like Josh with everything you described, but in 2020, you know. So now there is this, there's this Ford band on the road after that moment. Um, and and Chloe, you you edited the film as well. Um, are are you editing um, as you are filming, or or is a process that happens at, completely afterwards? Uh, yeah, I think I, I have always done the first cut of my film, if I know the, the sole editor. Um, and I realized that because I grew up wanting to be a manga artist, I wanted to be an animator. So, so in my mind, I didn't write in words first, it was always drawing pictures. So everything, stories always told picture after picture. And so even when I'm writing the script and directing, I'm constantly editing in my head. And that's why my script might feel a little thin sometimes because I'm literally editing it in my head as I'm writing. And then on set, the, way, the reason why Josh and I have such a shorthand because he's seen me working in the edit for two films and he knows how I'm going to edit the scene. So he's giving me all that extra stuff. Um, and, and instinctually, I, I call it's a wrap for the scene only when I knew there's enough for the edit and I can't quite process exactly what it is until I get on Avid. That's why it's very scary for me to like all of that because a lot of times I don't quite understand why I made the choice on set until I went into the edit and understand why I did what I did. Mm. Sergio, so you you alluded to the fact that you traveled um, to all these different, of course, uh, landscapes. Um, can you, can you tell us what that was like? Were you guys traveling in vans just like the the nomads in the movie? Yeah, it's it, it, it was very very challenging for me to to bring this uh, very natural uh, of the sound. So I I would like to put my finger on, on this because the post production we do everything during these pandemic days and we do everything remotely. So Chloe was very specific with her notes, the specific sound notes during the whole trouble. And I just follow her, uh, her idea and, and bring to the film a specific, very specific sounds for each season, the intensity or, or or specific sounds surround us because in, in, in many ways, there's a lot of life in every single sequence in terms of, of sound on screen and off screen as well. So yeah, it was very challenging to find the right and specific elements for, for that journey. Um, you know, Peter, I'll follow up also the, the, you know, can you tell the audience, did you guys shoot chronologically um, or, you know, what was the journey like, um, you know, when you were actually physically in the different towns? Um, well, like I said, we had this little pre-shoot early on, uh, which was uh, not going to be chronological, but, but mostly we we tried to shoot from, uh, you know, the beginning of uh, her story through to the end of the story. And, uh, you know, it was also, I think, very important to do that because when you're working with a lot of non-actors who don't have the ability necessarily to just drop in to understanding, you know, oh, what happened in two scenes earlier or not, you know, they've, they, the, not, the nomads and uh, were coming along with us and had been, as we're all living our lives together for these many months, you know, they're, they, you want to create for them, I believe, and maybe I'm speaking for Chloe, you want to create for them uh, as organic uh, and a safety net as possible for them to be as truthful in their performance as they can be and relying on, us, on their ability to understand that this part of the story is happening, you know, not in order or something, I think 
might have complicated things to some degree, but it was pretty remarkable, even for non-actors, uh, how uh, how talented the people were that we were working with, and how game they were to you know to be work on screen with Francis McDormand and David Strathairn, and, and and hold you know more than hold their own. I mean, the the, the ability. I mean, I'm, I I began as an actor. I know that one of the the sort of secret cards you know you have in your pocket as an actor is really isn't necessarily your active performing it's your ability to listen and and it very active listening is i mean we've seen francis's these incredible performances from francis uh in all the movies she's done but her i i think her performance also in this movie as as in the way she listens and connects with these people uh, is astounding and and created also again this other safety net for them to just really just be themselves and 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 tell speak from their hearts and uh, and it really comes across on the screen. Um, Chloe, you do not um, comment politically on 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 the characters and the situation and and that is a remarkable aspect of the film. Can you can you talk about that? Well, it doesn't mean I don't have political opinions. I have plenty of them. And when I see you someday, <laughs> I'll tell you all about how I feel about the world. But that's, I separate that from me as, as a filmmaker. Um, because, you know, you put, you put, you tell a story, you put a story out there. You never know where the world is going to be. And you never know the person who is viewing the film, where they are in their lives. To me, you know, cinema is about sharing. It's about this interaction. And I, I like to leave things as open, open-ended open um, and inclusive as possible so that they can watch the film with their own conditionings and take it away and then have a discussion. You know, and also I, I think some people might think the film is very political and some people might think uh, upset and it isn't. Um, to me, when you put a camera on something, on anything, you create a perspective, you know, and, and it's almost inevitable not to have an opinion. Um, but, you know, for Josh, for example, for, to shoot, to choose to shoot people who live on the peripheral of the society, have done this three times now, at the most beautiful light, uh, is, is a choice, you know, and that in itself, to me, is a, is a political statement, as opposed to with the most harsh news light uh, they of the news camera. You know, these are all political statements that we're making. Uh, mm -hmm. Just depends how you interpret it. Mm -hmm. um, and Josh, I have, the film geek in me has to ask you about, um, but the Badlands, um, you know, Terrence Malick um, obviously did a masterpiece in the Badlands. Uh, you know, what was it like being there, what was it like, um, you know, shooting in the Badlands? Well, f Badlands, I think, actually, Roger, because I made the same mistake. The Malik Badlands, I think, is Montana, isn't it? But anyway, it looks, it's a similar kind of thing. But um, I've, I've wa I wanted to go out there for years, Roger, because I read um, Bury My Heart, A Wounded Knee by Dee Brown when I was about 14. And that, um, I guess, my romanticized notions of Native America, I just fell in love with that alongside the kind of love of Westerns. So that was what led Chloe and I to make Songs My Brothers Taught Me Together. Um, so the fact that we've got to do three films there has been um, an absolute privilege, actually. It's, we, Chloe, we miss South Dakota terribly. I think it... I mean, one of the biggest surprises to me of just piggybacking off the political thing, Roger, is that how quickly you just find a common ground with people. When you, you go into places where you just, you're sure, you have all these preconceived ideas and you have no idea when you arrive where you got those preconceived ideas from. And then you just look around and take it in. And, and that's what's happened to me with places like South Dakota. I actually know wall drug South Dakota better than I know London now, which is just strange to me. <laughs> but it's been um, not just cinematically, but the people and culture there. I highly recommend it. <laughs> yeah, you know, we didn't have 
uh, in all the time we were there living amongst these people, I, that did not have one political conversation, one kind of conversation that was overtly political. And uh, it was really uh, just a reminder of the, I, I, I think something that like, I read recently I, was um, Mike Nichols said, you know, that there's just so few films that are genuinely that are dealing with sort of a genuine kindness, you know, that, that, that that's sort of what is the core of that. And I, I think that that was certainly the case with this movie, but it also felt like just really also the case of living in this community for this amount of time with these people. Like that was the prevailing sentiment among this tribe of filmmakers and the people we were living with. Yeah, and to, yeah, so go ahead. But the political fear as well, it's, it's almost like to me sometimes it'd be because if film is meant to be closer to the language of dreams, how boring would it be if we tried to interpret our dreams politically? Mm. How boring. Like, oh, maybe that's got something to do with your thoughts on Joe Biden or like, you know, your maybe like that's it's about the universal, you know, it sounds pretentious, but you know, Chloe's telling universal stories. It'd be such a disservice to reduce these people to their political standing on the current American landscape. Mm. No, this is how I feel. Uh, Chloe, you alluded to the to the fact that um, Fran, um, you know, had to bring things of herself. So, so the plates, um, the pot holders, those those are actually her belongings that she brought along? Well, the plates were, um, we found them on Etsy and, and it, it was, but it was the same print as the ones that her father, the same story, you know, that her father gave it to oh, her okay. from school. And friends started making pot holders at the beginning of the shoot. And uh, I don't know, she probably made over 50 pot holders throughout the whole shoot. Every time I say cut, she's ready to make a pot holder and she's handing out, there's a bit of a, Francis McDormand pot holders everywhere in the American West. And someone's left. <laughs> <laughs> She's left a trail. And and last but not least, to and and it's a question to all of you. You, you know, this movie is so of the moment um, because because in this spite of COVID, um, we all are undergoing what Fern, in some way, what Fern is undergoing. And, and we have to learn to be okay with what is happening. You know, can you, can you, can you tell us, did you guys, you know, how, how, do you, how do you feel? You've been with this film for so long and haven't seen it evolve during this period, you know, can, can you reflect on that? You guys go first. Peter? Uh, well, I was going to say, you know, we certainly had no way of knowing when we uh, started the process that we would be at this moment. And yet it was people sort of at the same time, I would say, I mean, it was there and it was there, this, this, this sense of, uh, of people feeling and being marginalized of, of, of this sense of folks uh, not sure what the next day was going to bring, uh, I mean, was, is, is not, it, it, it's compounded certainly now, but it is something that's been happening certainly since 2008, if, if not before. And so I, I, I think it is, uh, we all, I think Francis and I from the very beginning believed that there was, that this was going to resonate in a certain way. And we're hopeful that it would, it certainly did for us when we read the book uh, and it felt real and true. And it didn't feel like a historical piece and it didn't feel like a fantasy piece. It felt as real then as it feels certainly now, but certainly the ability that everyone has had a moment to stop and, uh, and to, take note and, and, and to uh, waken up to a, uh, you know, this shared sort of feeling. And again, I, I say this sort of shared humanity uh, is certainly wonderful and a great, and, and uh, it's not wonderful that it's happening, but it's wonderful that the movie should be speaking to people uh, in a way and to more people than perhaps it might have uh, then. So we're very, I, I mean, I speak for Francis and I, and, and I hope for all the one who made the film, we, we are, uh, we are feel the uh, responsibility of and the honor of being able to tell this story right now and have it 
live now out of our heads and hearts and live in the heads and hearts of all of you guys who come and see the movie now and, and you'll take it on hopefully with you all on, on, on your journey. Mm. Zach, let, let me hear from you. Having worked on the film, how, 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 how does it feel now when you reflect on it? It's, a, it's a, one of the best experiences of my life. I mean, it, it came at a time that, um, you know, uh, I didn't think there was a chance that I would be a part of a, a you know, a project that was actually being made, uh, much less one that had such heart and soul and, and was being made by, by filmmakers who uh, were just such beautiful and loving and supportive people. And um, I, you know, it's, it, if you had asked me nine months ago or eight or seven months ago, if, if something like this could have happened in the midst of COVID, I definitely would not have thought it was possible, but it was, uh, it was medicine for the soul at just the right time for us, not, not just in terms of the storytelling, but also the process by which we made it and the, the way we all got along and, and how, how the family aspect of making the film really felt so great the whole time. And Chloe, let's, I would love to to hear what 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 would you like the audience to get out of um, seeing your film? It, you know, it's been a it's been a tough year. You know, beyond the pandemic, so much has happened to to all of us, and and you, you feel the way whether it affects you personally or not. And that's that's how Fern is when you first met her at the beginning of the movie. You know, and that's that's what many of the people we've met out there had gone through back in 2008. And, you know, the way of life that as we know is gone and it's just never gonna be the same, but it's okay. And that, that was definitely a healing lesson for me, almost prepped me for the pandemic. And, you know, the little things, the little triumphs that we have in life, you know, the Buddhist monk would say, chop wood, carry water. Fur makes her breakfast and, and, and does laundry. And that's good enough for today. And doesn't matter how much tragedy and things we go through in life and it's just one day at a time. And eventually it becomes a choice. Eventually we find our way, we find ourselves, you know? So I, I hope that this film will, will make people, um, give people hope in that sense. Oh, great. Well, guys, um, it's been such an honor. Sergio, Josh, Zach, Peter, and Chloe, um, congratulations. And, um, and thank you for spending this 45 minutes with me. I, I will definitely cherish this conversation. Thank you, Rocha. Thank you. Thank you. And happy holidays. Happy holidays. Merry happy holidays. Merry Christmas. Bye-bye. See you guys.